Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Alana Rabinovich, and I am thrilled to introduce our second power panel of the year. Tonight, we present African Lit Contours and Conflicts. This evening features six incredibly accomplished and talented Black writers, thinkers, and scholars. Our host this evening is Scott Fraser, president and publisher of Dundurn Press. Tonight, our panelists are Donna Bailey Nurse, Francesca Equiasi, Antonio Michael Downing, and H. Nigel Thomas. Welcome to you all. Scott will delve further into your bios during the conversation and get tonight's event underway. To all the viewers tonight, please do take advantage of the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Scott will take as many questions as possible at around 7.45. So without further delay, Scott, please take it away. Thank you so much, Elena. Good evening, my name is Scott Fraser. I'm thrilled to be joined today by four very talented people. Uh, we have the critic and author, Donna Bailey Nurse, author, poet, and scholar, Nigel Thomas, author, filmmaker, and visual artist, Francesca Equiasi, and author, activist, and rapper, Antonio Michael Downing. If we were here together in person, I would ask for a huge round of applause for these talented people. But since we're not, let's get into it. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi there. Well gone. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> we are very, very heavily uh, um, tilted towards uh, um, Black Canadians of Caribbean uh, um, origin. And uh, uh, Francesca, we won't hold that against you. Uh, we won't, I promise I won't let the, the, the I won't let them team up on you. I mean, right they on. can. I'm from Lagos. <laughs> so you're pretty tough. <laughs> <confident. laughs> <As it is. laughs> I was gonna say. <laughs> well, you know, just by way of breaking the ice, why don't we go around? And uh, I'm interested. So, so Francesca, you're from Lagos. Thanks for sharing that. Antonio, how about you? Where, do you, where, where, where? Do, what's your, your origin story? Um, wow, well, origin story in the comic book sense is a different thing, but um, I was born in Caracas in Venezuela. I grew up in Southern Trinidad in a tiny little one road village called New Grants. Right on, thanks for sharing. Nigel, how about you? Well, I was born in St. Vincent a long time ago in a tiny village. Well, not so tiny as villages go called Dixon. And I've been living in Canada, principally in Montreal and Quebec City for the last 53 years. Thanks for sharing. Donna? I was born in Toronto to uh, Jamaican parents, and I grew up in Pickering, Ontario. Right on. I was born in Ottawa myself, a Jamaican father, Canadian mother, and uh, uh, Durham region is also where I, I grew up. It was a oh, very really? different place before all the all the, the really? Caribbeans uh, flooded the place. Wonderful. I, I was there. I was one of the first. We were one of the first. We were like oh, wait, 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 pioneers. What school, you, what school did you go to? I graduated from Sinclair Secondary in Whitby. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Shout out to anyone from Whitby there. Shout out. All right, let's get into it. Um, Antonio, when I worked at uh, at Penguin. Um, it was very, it was pretty rare to see black authors on the domestic list. Now I fast forward a few years because it wasn't a, a super long time ago and that's not the case anymore. Um, every serious publishing firm is almost, uh, uh, you know, trying to showcase black writers in a way that I've never seen before. Is this the, uh, is this the, the, the moment where we can say black writers have won? And uh, is this the apex of inclusion for, for Black Canadian writers? You're yeah. laughing at the question already. I ask it. I, it's a genuine sentiment. No, yeah. no I, I'm laughing because I can see Donna smile and I know what she's thinking. She's thinking, <laughs> she's thinking they've declared thinking. this victory before. <laughs> right, Donna? I am thinking that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, here's the thing. It's, it's like, um, I, you know... I think I think black culture is is um, because of because of shared black experience and the kind of like unrelenting struggle uh, against like colonialization, colonialization, etc. I think black culture is always very fascinating, but um, I I also think that um, people don't 
I feel like there is a falling in and out of love that goes on over and over and it comes in cycles and waves. Oh, you know, they, they shot George Floyd. So, oh, we, we, and suddenly we remember black people are important and part of our history and important. And even Black History Month, right? It's this, oh, let's just remind ourselves. But I mean, the truth is, um, regardless of the fashion, black writers have always been here. We've always been here, we've always been writing. And in fact, we've always been creating dynamic work. And, and so for me, you know, people, I'm very loath to believe that anything real has changed other than we're going through another cycle where we are in fashion and the fa and fashion by definition changes. So um, I, you know, that's, that's my, I don't know if that's pessimistic and, and I applaud my publishers, Penguin Random House for, you know, for empowering me and, and giving me a platform and, and the wonderful work everyone at my publisher did. I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not ungrateful in any way, but to recognize the wider trend, I just feel like it comes and goes and there are seasons. Well, I know Donna wants to, Donna, can you, can you respond? I would love to hear Donna's take, take on this. Yeah. Because oh, oh, and maybe tell us She's been a history. critic for yeah. a lot, lo for longer than we have. And so she's seen the season come and go. That's it. That's trying to say thing. that I'm just way older than everybody or? What? I'm saying you're wiser <laughs> than all of us. Oh, okay. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you say that this is the moment, um, I think we've had, this is a wonderful moment. Like we can't underestimate this moment. Because just, you know, on the face of it, we have, um, you know, in Essie Adigen, one of the great Black writers, and she is really uh, an international, not, not necessarily, we, we can own her as Black Canadian, but she's a great uh, international writer at this point. And there are other people like that. Nalo is, is like that, you know, and... Um, it, it's not, it, I think we have to recognize that yes, this is a special moment, but I would say there has been an earlier moment and earlier moments. Um, what I'm thinking of particularly is this span of time between the early to mid 1990s and to 20, up to about 28, 2010, or maybe up until t around the time of Half-Blood Blues that, that was, was published. And I really remember, because that's kind of when I started writing about black books. I kind of remember, for some reason, it's Andre that stays with me from that time. And I remember that Andre brought, Andre Alexis brought out a book, Despair and Other Short Stories, very spooky, making Ottawa this kind of staid, white, dull place. <laughs> oh, sorry, not, not dull, but <laughs> staid, white, Certainly not respectable this week. place. Not these days. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Scott. <laughs> respectable place into this really spooky, eerie, mysterious place. And then he brought out Childhood, and that won a couple of awards. And at that same time, Rachel Manley brought out Drum Blair, and she got a G Governor General's Award. And at that same time, Janet Sears um, brought out, uh, pop, um, produced Harlem Duet, and she got a Governor General's Award. And it was just, you know, Ken uh, Wewa, how do you say, Cyril Wewa? And all these different writers, one after the other, after the other, practically up until about Afua Cooper, Lawrence Hill, practically up until. So there, there has been, I would say, you know, that what I want to say about that time for me was that it was more organic. We were like, what the hell is happening? Where, where did this come from? You know, and it was, it wasn't, it didn't seem to be motivated by anything other than just a kind of energy among the Black uh, writing community itself. And so I, I find you're right, it's different now. You said that we're being, black writers are being courted, sort of being courted by publishing houses. And I think that's wonderful. I really think it's wonderful that people are knowing they have to reach beyond and make sure that um, black writers are represented and that they build up their black um, publishing lists. But at the same time, um, I think they know they need to do that because they don't have the proper channels in place. No, they have to, they have to reach out because 
for some reason, they don't have the, not for some reason, systemic reasons. The we know what the channels, reason is. Yeah, I know, I have a, I have a few <laughs> ideas. <laughs> but I, th I think there ain't no black publishers. Exactly, <laughs> they don't have the proper channels. They still don't have the proper channels. We should be building on that momentum, building on the momentum of SE, building on, on the momentum of all those people. And yet, you know, they, they still have not um, opened, you know, it's still not, accessible for the for black writers yeah i i just i just oh, want to sorry. say yeah, go ahead, Nigel, sorry. Go ahead. okay i just want to say that that period in which rachel and uh, janet says larry hill and others was followed by a period in which agents were telling black writers that publishers were saying the books by black people don't sell and therefore they were not taking books by black people. So I, I, I mean, I'm saying this to reinforce the idea of the wave. Um, but it, it, was, I, I, it, it wasn't all quite that way because I can tell you that in 1993 when my novel came out and I, went, I was launched at Eden Mills and that Sunday, Several people read, including Timothy Finley, some of you who are younger would know who he was. But when the signing came, the lines were long for the white writers. And I think I sold all together that day four books. Mm -hmm. And it was quite clear that the audience at Eden Mills was not interested in Canadian reality from a black perspective. So I just thought I'd throw that in there. And I don't know to what extent that has changed. And I do hope what's happening at the moment isn't just a wave. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I wanna hear from Francesca and then I'm gonna talk about what I've seen from the publishing, from a publisher's point of view. Um, mm -hmm. I think you'll be interested to, to notice. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm really stoked to be here. And I feel very much out of my league because I don't know much about publishing. I know about writing and reading. And I know that like black writers have been writing brilliant work since well before I was born. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, but in terms of publishers, I believe it's to their benefit to reach out to and showcase black work. But you know what, um, what Antonio was saying, like I am also grateful and I am not guessing it twisted. <laughs> I'm, I'm sellable and I know that's why there's interest in my work right now. And I'm grateful because I love to write, um, but it doesn't solve anti-blackness. You know, publishers being interested in black writers in this moment doesn't solve anti-blackness. And the reason perhaps, I think, I don't know, but perhaps the reason, you know, Nigel, that story about only selling a few books is because of anti-blackness and um and while like we're i just want to say like while we're stoked that like black authors are being showcased now and there's waves and you know all that um you know we're not we're not commodities and our stories have existed before and will continue to exist and they're brilliant and they're nuanced and you know they're excellent and also mediocre and that's cool um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah that's all i wanted to say well, I appreciate that. It really, that, that's actually a really nice segue. I'm not going to bombard you with what I was going to say, um, because I wanted to talk about uh, a little bit about the the state of uh, um, review culture, criti criticism of black writing. And, and I have a particular, I guess I'm going to aim this at Nigel and Donna primarily, uh, but I, I have a, this particular um, uh, disappointment, I guess you could say, at the decline of, of of substantive book coverage, uh, especially in, in sort of popular publications like newspapers, magazines, et cetera. Now, there's still some some good good venues out there, but they're certainly in decline. And, and I'm trying to think of, um, I don't think I'm alone in saying that when you do see this like a mainstream, especially in February, uh, for obvious reasons, you know, it's like, it's always kind of this, this inane celebration, kind of like, oh, 10 readers, you must know. And it's like, well, tell me something interesting about them right, right like what's their what's their what, do they have a personality do they have an opinion on anything or is it just that they have the appropriate melanin 
So, so Nigel, what's tell us like, what do what do you see out there? What's the state of of, of uh, yeah, well, uh, well, black well, writers being treated yeah, seriously? Well, well, black history, just to comment that black history uh, is essentially a sort of a flavor of the month thing, um, and uh, of course, as you say, CBC, whomever. Um, they highlight stuff because they feel they have some sort of a duty to do so because it's called Black History. Um, and I don't think most of us are taken in by that. Uh, in terms of in terms of our work getting out there and receiving valuable, insightful criticism, I don't know that I don't know what to say about that because first to begin with, the space has to be there for uh, these uh, critiques to appear, reviews to appear. And we all know that print journalism has considerably reduced the space that is a given to books. Second, um, uh, they generally ask you to review books. And if the offers don't come, there is just no way you can review books. I, I, at one uh, early on, I think somewhere around 2000, the Gazette had actually thought, the Montreal Gazette that is, that they might engage me as a reviewer. And then suddenly budgets got cut and um, I think I did one review for them. Um, and, and so it goes, I, the, the space just isn't there. Occasionally um, some journal, um, literary magazine might ask me to review a book and, and I have a feeling that they particularly probably don't like the reviews that I write. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you see, there's a whole lot of things. No, I no. People come to, I mean, Black reality has already been framed in the minds of North Americans. Mm -hmm. And when people write, they want to be able to identify with the material that is in there. And if that material doesn't quite conform to their expectations of who Black people are, they are not so keen on embracing. Mm -hmm. you, I, I wanna, I'm gonna go to Donna, but do you, uh, uh, maybe Donna can answer this question. Do you think that do you think that North American readers uh, outside of so I'm going to say non-black uh, people in North America do you think that they that they that there's a desire for black trauma in fiction and do you think that 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 Ooh. do you think that, that is there something almost fetishistic about about the books that tend Ooh. to rise to the top? Okay, so. I really, I'm not sure I want to answer that. I want to speak to more about what, what Nigel is saying. And I, but I'm going to tell you why I don't want to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> it's because, you know, um, I don't really spend all my time thinking about what white people like or don't like, um, which is, I, 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 so I, when I think about trauma, I mean, I, when I think about black experience, that's not our only experience. But all of us are coming from, we, we have to acknowledge that experience because it's really shaped our culture. But that's not our only experience. But at the same time, I don't feel like I have to ignore that experience. And, and I don't feel like guilt. I don't feel like, oh, it's, you know, I respect those people who were my forebearers who survived. Um, I miss those people who I was separated from and I you know I so I don't like I feel like we're taught to even disdain our own trauma and that just aggravates me mm. there's no reason to feel great or bad about it. it's our experience so mm. um, I, I I don't I don't I don't necessarily agree but anyways I really want to speak to what Nigel was saying mm -hmm. I don't agree that um only that white people are not open to um, reading our stories. And let me just give you an example. Uh, not just white people, they're not interested in reading or writing our stories. Let me just give you a, a true example. Um, when I started writing for, this would be like, you know, in the 90s for the star, I was doing book reviews and I, I went to them. I said, you know, I'd like to do, actually, you know, I lost a job. <laughs> and I went to them and I said, well, I'd like to start doing book reviews. I thought, well, I could, I could do that, be home with my little kids, right? 
And they said, uh, Judy Stockman said, okay, yes, yeah, you know, write me some book reviews. And then she liked them. So I started writing about black writers and I loved it. I just, I loved it. And I also started at that time doing kind of um, small profiles for Maclean's. And one of the persons, people I wrote about early on was Cecil Foster. And um, mm -hmm. I remember him saying, you know, Donna, the, the papers are never going to let you write about white people. They're never going to, you're, you're going to have to write about black people. And I was like, well, you know, I want to write about black people. But I also knew he was wrong because I knew that if I got any significant attention, white journalists would want it. So years, a few years pass by, I start contributing to the Globe and Mail. And when I'm writing for the Globe and Mail, I, I was like, okay, this is it. I'm going to do, I want to do these kind of Vanity Fair type uh, literary profiles, a little bit sexy, whatever, you know. And I, I, because if I do that and they're really engaging, then, um, then the audience will really be interested in the Black author and then they'll really we want to read the black author's work, you know, so I thought, okay, that's what I'm going to do. And so I, I, I literally, I, I literally threw myself into that. The first one, my editor was James Adams and he thought it was a great idea. So I threw myself into the first one and that was Austin Clark. And I, I did, he just had a new book out. And then after that, there was Dion and Brand and there was, you know, Janet Sears, all different people, right? But what I want to say is that I threw myself into it and right away, the response was so strong so strong all around, not, not just Black people. Black people were jumping for joy, but it was all around strong. Why? Every picture was attached with a beautiful photo of a beautiful Black person that you rarely would see in the globe. So you had the beautiful Black mm -hmm. face. Then you had the, the story that had two Black people in public talking, something you never would see in the globe. Then you had the, the different kinds of subject matter that was different too. So it was all very, very different. Okay, mm -hmm. so right away, almost I would say second, third story, um, the uh, the white uh, the white arts journalists at the Globe. Most were staff, but they weren't all staff. They'd just been there much longer than me. And we start to hear. I start to hear. Why is Donna getting all these big? Why is she getting so much space? And James is like, don't worry about it. This is all about real estate. <laughs> it's all about real estate in the paper. And he says, don't worry about it. But then it just, you know, what? it's not fair. Why does Donna get to write about all the black writers? Huh? Why do you get to write about all the black writers, right? And I'm laughing now. I, I'm laughing now, but I was not, it, it got really, really bad to the point where I finally said, okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to just go back to doing book reviews. I'll do them for the uh, Martin Levin and Jack Kirchhoff, who were the wonderful book editors at the Globe, and they gave me whatever, and it was wonderful. But there's two things to, to say about that. I, I had started out wanting to do these wonderful Vanity Fair pieces for the Globe. And so I kind of lost my groove and lost my confidence. I, I wasn't, you know, I, I couldn't, I didn't come flow for me like it used to. I, it affected my craft. And second of all, my career was shooting up. But when I started to go back to do the reviews now, I, I lost the profile. And so that's money, right? That's money for my kids. That's money for my marriage, you know? Mm. And so don't, that's systemic. That's, that's how, it, how it works. But what I also, so that's how it works. That's how, you know, you get there, they expect you to be an ornament. You, be, you begin to take up space, you're out, okay? But the other thing I wanna say is that they loved our stories. They, the audience loved the stories. The journalists knew that those were the stories that the audience really loved. And if you look today, it's very, you will see again and again that uh, you'll rarely see, let me just say, black critics doing black books in the globe. You know, you'll see it sometimes, but they want those stories because they're great. So it's not true that they don't value our stories. They do. Yeah. Well, I, I was going to say that what I see as a, a former sales rep and as a, a guy who's constantly looking at sales spreadsheets, I, I do see some some reasons to suggest that it's it's, it's not just um, it's not just black people who are buying these books. It can't be. Um, and and when we launched a, a new literary imprint uh, in the middle of a pandemic, the breakthrough title was was authored by a black woman. You know, so so this this is uh, is ten, and and not just in Canada either, in, in the United States. So, 
I, I have, you know, I, I think we have dark, we, we live in dark times, but there's little rays of light. Um, French, does anyone else want to wait? And I have, I have way more questions for all of you, but Francesca. Has <laughs> I wanted to, yeah, I just wanted to shout out my, my publisher, Arsenal Paul, because um, if you look at their catalog, they didn't just start publishing like racialized authors or like queer authors. Or, I mean, they've been, so that feels, I feel so grateful for that. And I think there's moments and there's times where there's that alignment, which is not to say publishers can't start making those changes, but it can't be the thing about it being a trend is just like, you know, my, my whole body's like, oh no, like blackness is not a trend. We, yeah. we can't, yeah. how can that be? Our stories, yeah, anyways. <laughs> well, I, I, I have to respond to you, Francesca, because I want to just read verbatim from my notes because I think you're reading my mind somehow. Uh, so this is what I have written down. You published with Arsenal, a publisher known for having diversity embedded in its core assumptions long before it was trendy. Was that part of why you trusted them with your work? So I think we, uh, <laughs> I don't know, do you, like, I, I'm, I'm all for heaping praise on Arsenal Pulp. They're a terrific publisher. <laughs> um, I, I trusted them with my work um, because they were interested. Um, mm. And they were encouraging me. And, you know, I lied. Mm. I submitted um, what the pages that I had and said, I have a full manuscript. <laughs> I, I'm sure they knew. I mean, they allowed the <laughs> Well, time. they do now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do now. <laughs> they allowed the time. Um, and they saw value in me and cultivated that. And that's invaluable because I wouldn't have had the confidence otherwise. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, some, someone mentioned, I, I don't know, it's probably Antonio, but uh, one of you mentioned George Floyd. And I, I swear to God, someone asked me, I think it was like an official, it was like a survey or something. And it was, it was um, what have you done to change your publishing program in the wake of Black Lives Matter in response to George, it was specifically tied to George Floyd. And I thought, what an odd like thing to, to have is like okay so now publisher because it's not like when I get these questions it's not like anyone can see me they don't know what I look like right so it's just sort of like uh, everyone all the heads of firm I guess got this question it was like why specifically tied to George Floyd it, 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 so again it has to be like okay so now now there's been enough uh, uh, pain and, and suffering that people have to do something about people in my position have to do something about it it was it was wild they so, probably yeah, just learned that. about injustice. Yeah, yeah. They probably true. just realized that black yeah. people would be murdered. <laughs> oh God, it's like you laugh because the only alternative is to cry. Yeah, that's what my grandmother would say. Some things, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. So um, I'll just say that as a music dude, um, I see a lot of parallels. I see it across culture. Um, in terms of the appetite for black music, but it's like, you know, there's a, there's a thing and, and just entertainment is in general, I'm a sports guy too. I was an athlete in university, the Super Bowl just finished, you know, Eminem knelt in the halftime show and, and all these football fans were mad because we, it's there because people don't mind being entertained by us. It's, it's about what Donna said, taking up space, right? Or, or mm -hmm. being part or being empowered in, in a real way where it's not reacting to their taste. It's like actually saying, no, this is about us. Um, you know, but in music, like, like, you know, Lilith Fair, prior to Lilith Fair, everyone said, well, a woman couldn't headline a tour on her own, there would need to be, no matter how big they are, there'd need to be a male artist on the bill. And Sarah McLaughlin and Sheryl Crow, et cetera, said, actually, we're just gonna do it. Mm -hmm. And then they did it, and suddenly it was okay to have women, you know, and headlining tours. In in pop culture, you know, prior to Black Panther, which was just a few minutes ago, mm -hmm. and the prevailing wisdom was an all black cast wouldn't uh, white folks wouldn't go to see an all black cast and then they did it and everybody went and saw it because it was a great story right it was a great story powerfully told you might not be into marvel movies but if you're into that kind of thing it was one of the best and so i think i think that the appetite for black stories has never been questioned for black culture for black 
um, presence in a certain box has never been has never been debated. Um, what's beyond that is when you start to want to be something other than what that box is. And as a black man, you know, born in Trinidad, but I've lived here since I was 11 years old, and it's you become really quickly aware that there is a place for you. And if you play it, you're you're good. But if you push back against that in any kind of way, that might be a problem. So in my music life, I'm good when I'm doing hip hop, mm -hmm. but then that gives them a way to like discredit me. But I played rock and roll for most of my life. And they were like, well, what are you doing here? And I was like, well, I'm pretty sure Chuck Berry and Little Richard invented this. So what are you doing here? You know, it was sort of like, like, we already had Lenny Kravitz, so we're, we're already kind of full. We can't have another yeah, rock, but rock it's, and roller. Yeah, it's a very, yeah, it's a, and that I feel like that message is is sort of repeated. And I see that in in everywhere where black culture is. I see it as a kind of like, yes, we love for you to be here. We have this place. We have this suit. It's already made for you. Uh, it's, it's, we decided what size it is, what cut, what cloth, um, please fit into it. Oh, you don't fit into it. Let's find someone that does. And so, and there's a thing in music too, where the white gaze determines what becomes successful in black culture. So what Donna said, when she said how we talk to each other about what we do is different than how we end up talking to everyone else, because they're like, well, we'd like to select you because your story tells it in a in a convenient way like nigel was saying as soon as his opinions as soon as he starts talking those those vincentian queer montreal or black opinions they're like wait a minute wait hold on hold on so, so, <laughs> we need, so i want to i want to hear i gotta let, hear let from me nigel, let me just let me, yeah. let me just let me just add a very very quick um comment about that those mm -hmm. attitudes go right across the board yeah. right across the board the academy in, in culture and outside of culture i have been asked in quebec city at least 10 times why was i a professor were there no canadians and <laughs> quebecers qualified for my job Please. and people asked it and they saw nothing wrong with asking me that question so i mean look you're black we have a place for you Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the economic order. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, in, in Quebec City, the N word was a prefix for everything that was considered inferior. You had mm -hmm. N wages, N work, and N projects. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, it goes right across the culture. That's all I have to say. Fra oh, Francesca, please. what are you? Well, that's a lot. I mean, that, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, what are you seeing in the film world, Francesca? One of my favorite films recently was The Harder They, F the, the Harder they Fall, uh, where, where I almost said The Harder They Come, The Harder They Fall, uh, um, which, you know, I don't, I, I don't want to give away spoilers, but that was a, that was a blackity black film. Uh, what are you seeing in the filmmaking world? Well, see, like, I'm a novice and I'm a DIY girl like I I just write the script and apply for grants you know so I don't know I don't know what the trends are higher up um where the money is so to speak um so I can't really speak to that um other than the fact that <laughs> I think my you know the fact I I was born and raised in Nigeria um and I moved here I moved to North America when I was a, when I was a teenager but my formative years were you know, in West Africa, like Nigerians, mm -hmm. we're kind of annoying. There's a lot of us, we're loud, we have strong opinions. Um, <laughs> so, so I think that sheltered me from some of the, like internalizing a lot of things that I might have if I had been uh, raised from a younger age in North American culture. Mm. So what I oh, know I think, is, yeah, yeah. Nigerians, Black people are making like incredible work all the time. Totally, yeah. Yeah. That's what I know. I mean, um, African literature is taking over the world at one time. You know, it's literally yeah. taking over the planet. Yeah. You know? well, so, I especially mean, to the I, Nigerians. Yeah. I mean, the, it's I'm been sorry. taken over, right? <laughs> like, Chinawa, Chinawa, Chebe, things fall apart. I remember studying literature 
And when I read Things Fall Apart and his critique of Conrad's Heart of Darkness and how they portray the Black people when he's rolling on the riverboat down the Congo, I was like, but wait, he can't do that to Conrad. And then when I read, I was like, yes, he can. <laughs> <laughs> Nigerians been been repping it. But I mean, I mean, that's the beauty of the multitude of voices, right? And Absolutely. that's the that's the problem. It's like that's there's a multitude of voices, and you can't put Jamaica with Trinidad or St. Vincent. That's different people, different things. And, 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 you know, West Africa is a whole place and there's authors all over in French, in the French Caribbean and the French, the French Africa as well. So there's such a multitude of voices. There are queer voices. There are like, there are people who are first generation voices in Canada are different than people who were born elsewhere, like, like Francesca is saying. So there's such a, cacophony of voices and and that's why that suit that's made to fit before you even get measured that's the problem with it and i would say that that's a as as nigel so aptly pointed out that's not a problem with canadian literature or or culture that's just a problem with how with, with the narratives black people are forced into um, all the time. And that's what we're trying to smash. That's what we're trying to break. Like, you know, I love what Donna says. I'm not going to, I'm not going to define myself by the misery and the trauma. I'm also not going to ignore it because right. you're exactly. trying to do that to me. Right. Like it, we, that's sort of where I'm at, where I, I'm always thinking about how can I be radically me? How can I be as much me? Because I'm black, yes, but I'm also a man and I'm a lover and I'm, I'm an employee and an employer and an artist and a musician and a, an investor and a teacher and a coach. And all these, all these me's are me. And what I see about white artists, like I just wrote a memoir, it's right there. <laughs> um, I just wrote a memoir. I can't see it. <laughs> And uh, yo, I'm gonna pull one out for you. Bring, bring, bring it a little bit closer. Bring it a little bit closer. I, Show the people. I just, I just did a memoir, and I was influenced by like you know a lot of black authors, Maya Angelou, Audre Lorde, uh, and I was influenced also by um, Angela's Ashes and Frank McCourt and The Glass Castle and right. these great memoirs, which are just great stories about human beings. But every time I was interviewed about my book. And even in the way my publisher chose to promote my book, it was a focus on the blackness and the struggle and the identity. But if you read Angela's Ashes, I mean, it's the <laughs> 30s, it's the depression, and the, it's, it's yeah. poor Catholic Ireland. So it's yeah. way more struggle and adversity yeah. than I have ever seen. But I never read a, a, a review of that book that defines it by that. It defines mm. it by its humanity. And ultimately that is how any human being wants to de be defined. Right. None of us right. want to be fit into a box that's pre But you know, part of the problem is that, um, I, I'm going to say in the publishing houses, but I'm going to say even generally in the in scholarship, Black Canadian scholarship, um, mm. literary scholarship, we're not, uh, there's not an encouragement to read widely and there's not i mean we read widely right i know that this i know this panel we read wa widely so we yeah. can draw from this tradition that tradition that can you know and all of it all of it comes together to to create our work but you know a lot of people don't even read any even when they're they're going to be editing a book they read no black they know no black literature so they know yeah. no none of the ideas that we're dealing with, none of the issues that we're playing with. And for some reason, they can't seem to, you know, for example, this is gonna sound like a crazy analogy, but you know, I hate to bring this up, but Kim Kardashian is, you know, supposedly, you know, white and her daughter, you could say is black, but they're identical, they're, they're twins. And somehow people, you know, you, ha you have to see that things still look the same, whether one is white or black, you can, you can still have things that are um, resembling one another. And so I think that a lot of people, especially um, a lot of 
white critics, a lot of publishing houses, editors, etc. They don't read enough to be able to put black literature and mix it in with the whole that it belongs to. You know. Mm -hmm. well, I, I, I uh, sorry, oh, sorry, Francesca, I have to I have to jump in because I'm getting a notification about the time. Uh, okay. So it's the time in the program for me to remind everyone watching out there that not, if you have a question for any of the panelists or for all of the panelists, uh, drop it into the uh, into the Q&A and uh, we'll start getting to those. Um, and I, I suppose I should be actually monitoring that, too. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, um, so where were we here that was that was that was good and i had to just jump right in there francesca do you want to pick up that your thought there yeah i was just just what when donna donna was speaking i was thinking um yeah i think as equity seeking people like black people in north america and you know maybe black people from elsewhere like growing up in nigeria i read i knew so much about north american and european culture i read so much uh, so many authors beyond my immediate in fact, reading Nigerian stories about Nigerians that were like, like me was rare and exciting and didn't happen until I was a teenager. And I think that's what, what you're speaking to Donna, this thing that as you know, equity seeking people, we've had to be so much more all the time mm -hmm. um, just to be okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and it reflects, I think it reflects in our work. Like I love, I love reading work from like black people and from Caribbean people from Latinx people because there's so much and of course also North American white authors so much depth um in my experience and I guess my preference is that the soulfulness and the ah Donna I mentioned this before in a, a different interview we had double consciousness yeah. where you have to be aware of your own experience yes. aware of other people's right. experience and mm -hmm. translate that mm -hmm. space yeah. in between yeah. And I think as racialized people, we're always doing that. Yeah, that, that's you know, come up in our conversations before, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I, just, I just wanted to say something, though, that um, that I think we've not paid any attention to. Mm -hmm. um, it's really how many book buyers are there out there? Um, and uh, the, what's the competition among publishers and among authors? for that book by that diminishing. I think we, regardless of publishers have been saying that there's been a, a slightly upward bump during the pandemic of readership. But prior to that, uh, everyone was noting that readership was going down and writers earnings uh, had decreased significantly. And I mean like 40%, et etc. Et the statistics from the 1990s, 2000s, and so on and so forth. So what I'm saying is that I'm afraid that uh, in when there is such a competition for readers, for the few people who buy books, I am not sure where we are positioned, you know, on in on the scale. Ooh. You know, yeah. I mean. Um, I I think Marlon James is selling books. I yeah, think. he is. <laughs> I, but you you better you better be sure that you do have the resources of a powerful publisher who is going to you know get the book out there in the public's face. Right. It certainly helps. And, it certainly and, helps. But, and, but I, yeah. Nigel, I have to jump in just at the mention of of Marlon because certainly, like I was at Penguin. Canada when when a brief history was was in uh, arc now, right. that was not a book that anyone in the room and I was I was there uh, no one no one was interested in this book it was considered yeah. very marginal and the right. reason was was because of the language and his de deliberate use yeah. of Jamaican and yeah. and mm -hmm. I was the one voice who put my hand up and said well we're in Toronto everyone can <laughs> speak a little Jamaican okay it's not yeah. the end of the world yeah. put the put you know put put a bit of effort into telling people about this book because like, do you realize what the plot is do you realize like some of the historical figures that that are making appearances that this is we're, uh, has anyone looked at this seriously and the answer yeah. really was no uh because it, it was an import from the states and 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 i you know not to toot my own horn but i think i like to take a little bit of the credit for his results in canada mm -hmm. but that speaks to having the need to have black publishing professionals anyway Ooh. i need to Oh, I don't even, I, that was another one of my questions. I have to get to the Q&A. This is a great one that I want to ask. Uh, I think I want to address this to, um, to uh, 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 Donna first. 
Uh, the questioner uh, oh, no. is <laughs> the questioner is anonymous, but is wondering to what extent French language, Black Canadian writing, uh, at least some of which which has been translated, is considered part of Black Canadian literature by we, the panel members, and by the Black community and by readers in general. So let's talk about uh, um, well, have a have a have a crack at that. I, I'll speak about can the translation you, issues. Again, sorry, I just wasn't quite get my mind mm. around what you said. Sure. Uh, to what extent French language Black Canadian writing at least some of which has been translated, is considered to be part of Black Canadian literature by us as a, as a group, uh, by the, the Black community and by readers in general. Wow, I mean, like, that's just like a, a mouthful and a head full. I remember there was a time that I really, really thought, and I knew there's lots of interesting stuff going on because the Haitian community in particular, I knew there was a lot of interest, but um, I think that part of the issues are around translation and are around the fact that we don't get access to those books. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe that we would in, embrace them. And I'm, I'm surprised that there's not more going on. Maybe I don't know for sure because I'm not in Quebec. So yeah. I, I, I don't know if all those organizations, QWF and all those organizations are uh, uh, paying attention to their black writers. Uh, and we, all I can say right now is, okay, we've got Miriam Chansey, right? Everybody talking about Miriam Chansey, who was mm. raised, uh, born in Haiti, but raised in Quebec, and now has this marvelous book, but she's writing in English. Uh, I mean, right. She's writing in English. Not, so I, mean, I feel like Nigel I, would have. Nigel yeah, might have. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, all right, so first and foremost, we do have a black publisher in Montreal. Uh, Memoir d'Ancrier. Uh, uh, the publisher is Rodney saint Eloi. And uh, before I even answer the question about Black Right, I'd say that First Nations uh, living in Canada, whose language is French, never had a publishing outlet until Rodney saint Eloi established his publishing house about mm -hmm. 20 or so years ago. And it's only through Rodney that French Canada got to actually meet many of its First Nations authors. And of course, they're now winning prizes all over the place and suddenly they have discovered them. They, um, <clears throat> some, of, some of the books are being translated, uh, not many, a handful of them, because of the way publishing uh, is set up. Uh, you have to pay translators and the returns on the books are, isn't enough. The return isn't enough economic return for publishers to take on the public. So if, if the book isn't funded by uh, Canada Council and they have a specific budget for that, they, they can only allow so many of them, then that's the situation. And you, usually, usually for a book to get translated, it has to have won a prize or yeah. been nominated for a prize. The mm. risk has to be taken out because I I can speak from firsthand experience as a publisher, um, having been burned by a, a translation that we thought was going to be funded and it was not funded. And that's a big enough hole that that can kill a, a small business's oh, yeah. fiscal year. You know, it's 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 uh, it's real stuff, and that's people's you know people's jobs, people's. Uh, uh, um, employment there on the line. Mm -hmm. um, my friend Patrick Crean is in the audience and he says, uh, well, he oh, gives exactly. Nigel a shout out and uh, it points out that only 12% of the books Canadians read are by Canadians and the income of professional Canadian writers has dropped 27% in the last decade. That mm -hmm. is depressing as F. And uh, I mean, I think that could be an entire power panel in itself <laughs> talking about the decline of Canadian reader uh, the, the Canadians reading Canadians mm -hmm. yeah, that's such a huge topic does anyone want to take a I mean I, I again I could go all day long on that but I does anyone want to take a quick pop I, seconds? I love Canadian authors Canadian authors there's so much vibrant literature happening um, um like you know, I'm right now I'm reading Leanne Simpson I'm reading uh, Thompson Highway uh, you know, there, there are just so many incredible books, I, I think. And, and I think something that I've heard is that when Canadian authors, there's a great interest in Canadian authors internationally. 
but and again as a music dude i know this like when someone somewhere else likes you that's when canada appreciates you yeah. that's kind of a very canadian thing <laughs> all like, of a sudden it's cool it's like, yeah i remember <laughs> i remember it's, a, it's also uh, a caribbean um, thing yeah yeah very much so i remember uh, you know leslie feist was just uh you know touring around and then right? she went to paris and did an internship and suddenly she was an international star and everyone claimed her. And I feel like that's a very, that's that sort of passive aggressive Canadian thing where, you know, as a musician, if I'm in Memphis playing a show or Manchester playing a show, everyone's just giving you that love. They're like, yeah, I'm having this mate. If, if, if you're in Toronto playing a show, everyone looks around to see if the other people are cheering and then they <laughs> I feel like I feel like that's what it is. Um, how you solve that problem, I'm not really sure, but um, I, I, I think that, you know, like Canada produces so much great art, right? And, and the vibrancy of the, of the art we create crosses lines like I just I just heard Tanya Tagok's album and and Split Tooth amazing book talk about Canadian literature mm. um one of my favorites and Tanya Tagok's album with Saul Williams the U.S. um um spoken mm. word poet and and hip-hop artist so it's like I think the answer is to for us to again be radically us because the more vibrant we are the more us we are, then the then the stronger the lines we cross are. This Burgundy book up there, that is my U.S. publisher's version of my memoir, and which was contains does not happen in America, was not written by an American, and contains no American characters. <laughs> right? Well, you had a you had a great agent, and I guess so. I guess so, but the the, tr the truth is, and even Leanne Simpson, who I'm reading now, who I think is one of the best Canadian writers alive, I, I found out her about her from a Blackfoot American uh, publicist at my U.S. publisher, and and so all all of this to say, Canadian stories, Canadians might not be reading our stories, but our stories are vibrant and they have legs beyond Canada. Oh, I, I've uh, I have to agree. Yeah, yeah. Donna, mm -hmm. I didn't mean to cut you off there. Oh, did fine. No, I was just saying I have to agree. Like if especially, and I would say especially Black Canadian novels travel because you know yeah. we're from so many places. You couldn't pop. I mean, wherever you go in the states, you're going to see a number of Black Canadian authors. And whenever you go to Jamaica, we travel. You know, yeah. we're so multicultural within ourselves. Yeah. You know, Donna, I was in Jamaica in December, and um, I went, of course, as you do uh, when you work in publishing, you hit up all the, as many bookstores as you as you can. Oh. Now. I, I'm convinced that, uh, uh, and Antonio mentioned he's an investor, that we can make a little bit of money uh, selling selling books in, in uh, Negril because the bookstore there, I walked in and I said, I'm interested in buying some some books by Jamaicans. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the bookseller looked at me like I had three heads because she's like, oh, we don't have, we're, we have like notebooks and stationery. We don't like, but I said, man, are you crazy? Like, uh, there's a beautiful beach right there. What do people do on the beach? They read. <laughs> you know, let's go. Let's get a bookstore going down there. Are, are um, you familiar with Calabash, that literary festival? Very much so. I'm going in May. Right. Oh, are you, yes. are you going? I, I, I hope so. I'd like to. Yeah, go. yeah well, that's, that's it. If, if, uh... yeah. And so, one of the reasons that festival was started by Kwame Dawes, the, the poet, and Justine Hensel, uh, mm -hmm. Colin Tanner, was because they were having this issue with Jama with Jamaican readers that they believed most Jamaican readers believed that most books were textbooks. There were things mm -hmm. to study in school. And even, even if you had a novel, it would just be looked at as though it was a textbook. So yeah. they started the festival just to get read. And I think it was very successful. I mean, so mm -hmm. I'm surprised that you went to Negril and had that experience. Yeah, but there's an know. anti there's an anti-book learning kind of thing that happens like we want you to study and do good in school but I think the streets the working class is kind of like you know hey hey that boy over there that boy just read books yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Books. yeah. I, mean, I, I, like, I was, I was afraid right? you would say that because that's a secret <laughs> I, I want that secret to remain among us <laughs> <laughs> well I, I well, had we to can't. say 
Read it. We all have a grandfather swear. with the library at night. That's right. That's right. If, if every kid grew up, yeah. if every black kid grew up in Nigel's library, there there would be no problem with with uh, engaging in the text with the text. But no, yeah. it's for real. I have a business partner. My business, one of my business partners, looks at me and says, "Why well, yeah, black people don't read?" Maybe I mean I don't want to end this on a negative note. Not, like, let's not go there. It's not true. Yeah, Black people I, I wish I <laughs> wish you like, had raised it and <laughs> and so, okay, okay. Well, can so I just tell you how my my uh, my book? I'm so grateful. It's like I can't believe it. I'm so grateful. But my the people that tag me on social media are like Nigerian women. Yeah, Nigerian women. I'm yeah. just Nigerian people are reading. Yeah. they're reading a lot like bookstagram mm -hmm. is the whole thing and yeah. I, I'm sorry to be the weird millennial who's like Instagram <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think it really it shows me people are reading um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Nigerian. I and echo Nigerians that. Turn I've heard too. from so it many Trini people fun. and Jamaican people and even African people who grew up in the Commonwealth who have hit me up on Insta because what up um, yeah. <laughs> and and they've been like wow your book to, uh, like uh, black people are reading like there's no there's no yeah. question about that I just think it's a there's a certain segment of people who distrust the book because the books it come the, who makes the books well that's you don't make so books. we have time for for a couple we're gonna uh, we're gonna go here Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's very frequent for me to be at industry events where I'm the only black person in the room, especially when you're talking about people with real institutional power. Uh, so Antonio, I'm going to go start with you, Antonio. You can't go take the rest of the time, though. Uh, okay. you, have to, you have to. I'm going to cut you off after 30 okay, seconds. Cut me off. So, here we go. Answering podcasts, what happens? What try. happens when black <laughs> writing is curated by what, all white editors? What happens in that situation? Too easy. <laughs> well i mean i mean i think it just it, like it, the, the question answers itself i mean what do you think happens <laughs> i was i was I, trying to lob you a softball so you could hit a home run yeah <laughs> i mean it's just like i i'll tell you something that happened with saga boy real quick i my editor who's a marvelous editor a legend and i have so much to thank her for but she was asking me why do you call your half brothers brothers mm. and That's i thought brother. about this i'm like well because they're my brothers i don't think of them as half brothers and and then i realized the reason why is because when there's something to inherit, you have to be very careful on uh, what your designation is, right? Wow. Are you a full brother? Or are you a half brother? When there's nothing to inherit, <laughs> everybody's your brother. <laughs> it doesn't matter, and, right? It's your... <laughs> and so I thought about just how culturally, even when you have a legendary editor working on your stuff, if that person isn't doesn't have the cultural literacy, there's a learning curve there, which is not to say they can't do a, an incredible job, it's just to say that I think what Donna, to Donna's point earlier, it's you read it differently when you're from, when you know the subtext and you know the code and you know the, mm -hmm. the shared experience. I, so I'd really like to answer that. I promise to be really, really quick. Go stuff. for it, go for it, okay, Donna. So part, it's partly what uh, Anto Antonio is saying. They, um, black editors are essential. And one of the reasons why is because sometimes they don't know the question to ask to bring mm -hmm. out, uh, deepen the storyline. Um, white editors may not know the question to ask to deepen the storyline, uh, deepen an idea, encourage a conversation. So that's one reason. Another reason why is because obviously there are conflicts of interest. For example, uh, a friend of mine, a black writer told me his white editor got angry with him because one of his characters, uh, a black character, uh, refused to warm up to white people in the book. <laughs> in the book. Well, so I, 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 I had to keep some of my friends away from that person. That's right. <laughs> and, 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 and that's that's one. And you know that that's and there's there's another there's another point that I had about that. But anyways, there are conflicts that 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 go on. Oh yeah, and here's <laughs> here's something that I really I really oh, think man. that's important is that they ask us to over explain. Like yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that and that's what came up with Marlon, right? It's like yeah, someone's right. gonna have to. We're gonna have to put a glossary in here. Yeah, 
is yeah, it? Like, that's going to cost <laughs> an extra 30 cents. <laughs> or to remove, or to remove the dialect. The nuance. Yeah, yeah. 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 But did anybody ask James Joyce to take it off of Finnegan's Wake? Like Finnegan's Wake's a book that they have books about how to understand how, how to read it. I it's know. like... Yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> hey, so we are right up against the time. I want to do something in these, in these, in the spirit of the old uh, 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 spiritual, uh, raise every voice. So who are you excited about, Donna? Uh, who's someone, a, a Black writer that we should be getting fired up about that maybe we haven't heard of? Yes, well, I don't, I'm a person that reads backward, you know, like, I mean, I, I, I always know who I'm missing and I'm running back to find who I'm missing. Anyways, this writer, I don't think gets enough attention. Her name is Suzette Mayer. She's a oh, biracial yeah. write, writer, a queer writer, a, writing in Alberta. She's elegant, she's hilarious, and her, you know, she's been nominated for a Commonwealth Writers Prize, and she's been nominated, for, along listed for the killer. Her most recent book was, is Dr. Edith Bain and the Hairs of Crawley Hall, and it's one of those satires about politics in, uni in universities, so. Is that it's nice? hilarious, it's so it's funny. Right. So there's a fan in the room, Francesca, who, who, so did Donna take your pick? <laughs> no, I don't. I honestly, I don't know the writers that come to mind are well known. Like Tamara Tinji is brilliant, brilliant. I can't wait for her next book. Um, but I just want to gush about an author that is very famous. But I just read his first book. It's called. Um, his name is uh, Caleb Nelson Azuma. Um, the book is called Open Water, and it's just truly rocking my world. And he's he's a Black British author. He's well known. I just I can't get enough. Nice. Yeah, those are my two. <laughs> uh, Nigel, who are you excited about these days? I agree with Donna's pick about um, uh, Suzette Mayer, but I really want to pitch a book that is not fiction. Um, it's recently been published, and it's a book that I think should be read. Uh, it's called The Fire That Time. Uh, it's about the St. Mm. George Williams uh, Revolt in 1969, yeah. and uh, it's edited by Ronald Cummings and Nalini Mohabir. That's my book, The Fire Next Time. Awesome, yeah. thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I've heard about that. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. Uh, Antonio, do you have a pick? Do you have um, someone you're, you're pumped about? Yeah, I, I, you know, I ride for uh, 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 two authors I'm gonna mention because I think both their books are phenomenal. Um, neither a fiction, but Ronaldo Walcott, um, on property just blew my mm -hmm. mind this year. I was like, the way he connects the plantation to the Rastafari, to the police and to the defund the police movement. I mean, I was blown away. And I always ride for Kinesia Lub Lubrin's, um, yes, the yes. Disgraphist, nice, nice, nice. her latest yeah, yeah. Uh, book Good. of poetry. Yeah. I, I keep that by my St. Lucia, we're going on all out there. Um, <laughs> I, I ride for that every time. I think she, she is a great genius of right. Canadian letters and we celebrate her now before everyone else takes her. Nice, that's, <laughs> uh, that's exciting. Well, if I have, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say a Dunder, an author who we were publishing in September, it's uh, Tanya Turton, whose uh, no, debut novel is, uh, is called Green is a, uh, Jade is a, huh? Jade is a Twisted Green. And uh, I had a chance to present with her at a different book list. And she has the, she has that it factor that audiences are, so it's, on top of being a great writer, she has that, uh, that she can play an audience, she can work a room. So I think I've hit uh, some, some gold in that. Um, <laughs> so very excited, uh, very excited to smile. watch that. Yeah, no, no, it's all about sales, right? I come from the sales world. Uh, so we gotta, we gotta keep the lights on, you know? We gotta. <laughs> can I mention hey. one more author? Of course. Um, Andre Fenton. Uh, right now, he primarily writes YA. So uh, his book, uh, his first book was called Worthy of Love. Um, and he, uh, Worthy of Love Part Two is coming out this year. It's called The Summer Between Us. He also wrote Annika. And he's like African of a Scotian. Brilliant. Love, just love nice. his work. Yeah. Awesome. Well, so once this gets circulated, people will be frantically jotting down all these great recommendations. <laughs> and hopefully we'll see some sales. Uh, because writers need they, need they need the income from 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 sales. That's how they that's the bread and butter. That's how writers make their living. Mm -hmm. So uh, hopefully everyone will go out there and buy some books, buy some black authored books. And um, yeah, I think that's I think that's 
that's taking us right to the end. We're over yep. time, actually. Shout out to the Giller, and and I love every single one of you on here. You're fabulous and inspiring people. I've been I've been listening to your talks all day, and um, and Francesca, I love your book. Um, thank you guys so much. You bless my my soul. Well, I'm so glad that I have I I well I've I know Donna for a little while, but it's such a pleasure to meet uh, uh, everyone here and to engage in this reasoning and. Hopefully it's not the last time because I want I wanted to ask about uh, um, the fact that uh, Eric Williams Capitalism and Slavery has been published in the UK for the very first time. <laughs> and the, it's only taken 80 years, uh, but it's now now it's going to be available, uh, hopefully for a, an entire generation of British people to, to read and, and to think seriously mm. about reparations. And, and hopefully some of that will trickle over uh, to Canada uh, as well and the United States, because boy, do, does that book need to be well known. Uh, anyway, so that's, hey, there's my reading backwards, right? I, I'm catching yeah, up to my, <laughs> when was it published in the 30s? Thanks to all of you guys. You've been grateful. It's, I'm glad that the, uh, the old man is catching up with the younger folks. <laughs> this guy is one uh, yes. critic. So Nigel ancient. Thomas is one amazing critic, and he doesn't mention his book, which is not coming out to me. What is it, Nigel, the, the interviews? Oh, um, uh, Why We Write. Honestly, guys, he is an amazing critic. So I just wanted mm -hmm. to, to let people know because he doesn't do nice. his own yeah. <laughs> conversations with Canadian uh, poets and novelists. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. It's an honor to uh, meet you. It's an honor to be in conversation. Yeah. So here, here's Alana. Um, so, <laughs> folks, I guess oh, that's it for go. us. <laughs> yeah. <Picking> us out. <laughs> yeah, we got, we got, we out. We out. Peace. Well, I just, I, I just want to say what an incredible conversation. I am really humbled uh, by the depth of your investigation and the insights you all provided. And more than a little acutely aware that I have, you know, convened this panel because of Black History Month and um, quarreled with myself about that, you know, as a, as a bit of a tokenism. So I hope you can forgive me for that to our viewers. Please note that a video of tonight's event will be available in the coming days on our website, YouTube, and on Facebook. As I said, um, tonight was our second master panel, but please check back in March when it's all about the women. Thanks again to all our participate, uh, all our participants, and good night. Night. Alana. Thank you. Night, everyone. Thank you, night, everyone. Thank you so much. Right.